Hi everyone and welcome back to the interviews for physio students and new grads. Today's interview is with none other than Beth Sykes from Generation AHP. In today's interview we're going to talk about how Beth got to her band aid specialist physiotherapy role leading in older adults and then we're going to talk about older adults and this important population and how you as students and as new grads can best prepare to work with and to treat this incredibly important population and a population that we're going to be dealing with on a more regular basis as the years go by. So without further ado, let's get on with this incredibly insightful interview. Enjoy. Welcome back everyone to the interviews. So today I am really happy to be joined by Beth Sykes, probably most commonly known from Generation AHP. But today we're going to get to know Beth a little bit more, particularly in her role as a band eight specialist physiotherapist leading on older people. Um, Beth's currently working at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital um, as we speak and we're going to go much more into the roles and everything in her job currently um, to try and draw out some advice and tips for you guys as students and new grads. So welcome to the interviews, Beth. Thank you for joining me. Hi, James. Thank you very much for having me. And before we get started, um, you were supposed to get married on Saturday, weren't you? Yes, I was. Yes. I mean, yes, I definitely yes, remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, commiserations that that couldn't go ahead, but um, I'm sure when it can, you'll, you'll have a brilliant day. Thank you, Ro. Yeah, we've got it all booked in for next year. So, yeah, if you're watching this in 2021 in July, I got married, hopefully, <laughs> if, if she still has me. <laughs> so today um, we've obviously, as, as normal, gone out for questions. and We've had a few questions which have particularly honed in on your area of specialty, I think. Um, and that's going to be really useful. And I just kind of point out as well, your area of specialty has been my first posting as a band five in my first rotation so regardless of how useful this is to everyone else I'm hoping to get loads out of this for myself so it's gonna be a bit of a selfish interview this one <laughs> so we're gonna <laughs> we'll dive straight in we'll dive straight in so I think the first thing would be really nice to draw out we we know um, obviously generation HP has been around for a little while and we're going to go in a, a, to more detail about that later and hopefully everyone watching this is been some way involved with Generation HP and has, I'm sure got loads out of what you've created so far and I'm going to pick up on some of the things I've got out of the Generation HP platform that you've created but can you tell us a bit more about the role that you're in in the NHS at the moment Beth? Yeah sure so um, as you mentioned I, I work at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham and I've been there now for two and a half years Prior to that, I was at a, a neighbouring trust um, from being a new graduate up until that point. So I was actually at that trust for um, nine years. So kind of a long time and, and made the decision to move. The, the post I'm in at the moment is a, a clinical service lead for older adults. So within that, that is everything from admission of an older person at the front door at A&E, um, coming through in an, into an assessment unit and then coming through into the older adults wards and discharge beyond so it's a it's a whole pathway really um you know we we know that older people tend to spend longer in hospital than a lot of other cohorts of patients so really my remit is um kind of teaching supporting the staff in those areas providing clinically expert um reviews of patients and to, to some extent case managing the patients who um, you know repeatedly come into hospital for various reasons so they might be known to me quite well and I might have met them on, on three four five six of different occasions in different admissions and um, so it's just nice for those patients to have a bit of consistency and their family actually and um, just to have some consistency with a therapist and a, and a friendly face who they know is, is expert in that area um, I, I also do um, kind of outpatient falls clinics so as well as the bulk of my work being inpatient facing I do falls clinics a couple of times a week and that's a, a really good opportunity to get on top of patients who aren't yet at that level of frailty that they are frequently attending hospital but that they're, they're, they're almost 
demonstrating pre-frailty syndrome so that they're yeah. starting to fall they're starting to have issues with their memory you know there might be things going on at home so that's a really good opportunity to to make some real difference actually when they actually are still community patients mm. um so that's that's great to do a couple of times a week. Um, and then I also sit on the Trust's um, Falls group. So there's a we have a nursing Falls lead and I work very closely with her. Um, our Trust is huge. It's, it's actually four acute hospital sites now um, since wow. we merged. And with that comes a lot of processes, systems, policies um, to kind of get your head around. And mm. it's about doing what's, what's right for our older adult patients. The, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, as many of you will know, is, is a very big hospital. It's a tertiary centre, which means that it has a lot of specialist um, treatment going on there. It's a major trauma centre, lots of transplants. It's got the biggest intensive care unit in um, Europe. So actually, older adults tend to get a bit of a a bit less attention a bit less limelight on them because they aren't going for, for really complex surgeries they don't mm. end up on intensive care they don't end up you know being having research and things written about them so for a lot of patients locally the QE is their local district general hospital and they are going there because they've got a medical problem and um, so that's a, a large part of my role is, is trying to get staff to appreciate that alongside the rotations where they might get very specialist um yeah specialist yeah. experience okay yeah it's um it's interesting you mentioned there about so sort of that forgotten not forgotten but less thought of or highly regarded kind of area and specialty um with older adults um, and i think we're going to talk a little bit more about that kind of older adults and the terminology that use in there and there's an, there's another point there which we're, we're going to touch on later and that's the word frailty um because it's something that i've it's a term that's branded around an awful lot and i think is massively misunderstood so if you i'm going to point it out now we're going to come back to that later on it's because i think it's okay. quite an important one for <laughs> students and especially new grads going into into the services to kind of understand what frailty is and to a certain degree I, we haven't got that long to go through it but <laughs> So that's a really good overview of kind of where you are now, Beth. I mean, for, for us as students, it's I think, really nice to know, going back, all the way back, kind of yeah. um, to when you were a student and, and those challenging times, some of the things that you found most challenging as a student and then as a new grad. Okay, yeah, sure. So I think when I, I, I first got to university, you know, I, I was very clear from about year nine, year 10, that physiotherapy was the the degree that I wanted to do so you know my GCSEs my A-levels everything was geared towards very specifically knowing what I wanted to do um, but when I got to university I think that the hardest thing for me to come to terms with psychologically was that I, I wasn't a high achiever anymore my assignment marks were definitely different to what my you know A-level results had been and, and what my coursework and exam marks had been and I, you know, I was getting assignment marks in like the 50s, 60s. And, and when I look back, that by no means is bad. You know, you're, you're learning a whole new profession from scratch, aren't you? Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I think I mentally found that quite tough to kind of accept that and, and know that, you know, I, I wasn't at the top of the class and I, I wasn't necessarily excelling. I was passing and that was that was fine. Um, but on the flip side to that, I, I did very well in placements. So I think the reassurance came towards the end of first year, which was my first placement. And as soon as I started getting really good placement marks, it kind of outweighed the academic side of things. And I came to realize actually, I didn't need to be worrying about that because when I'm out in practice, the feedback I'm getting is excellent and, yeah. and I'm very certain that this career choice was absolutely right. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that was the biggest, biggest challenge really kind of the academic writing. And yeah, I think the frustrating yeah. bit was that I, I felt like I knew a lot of the subjects I was being asked to write about for assignments. And I, I felt like I understood it and I knew it, but I just couldn't translate that onto paper. Um, and, and get those kind of higher marks over the 70s where you know you have to be critical you have to use evidence-based yeah. practice and those kind of skills that just take a little bit of a while to 
to to embed in in your essay writing, don't they? Did you do you find just with the essays and stuff like that? I'm just thinking of, of myself because I'm very very similar. With did you find that when you completed the essays after writing the essay, you felt like you learnt a lot about what you were writing and you kind of you got out of it yeah. lots of learning. The grade def- maybe wasn't as high, but you still felt it was worthwhile in terms of what you learnt, so it still had benefit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's. If you go back to the principle about, you know, an essay is a method of assignment, uh, an OSCE is a method of assignment and um, assessment. Mm. And if you apply that principle to everyday life, you know, if I try to learn just to treat one patient and get that absolutely right, it, it wouldn't necessarily apply to the next patient. So you have to learn to understand rather than learn to be assessed. Yes. Um, yeah, that's a good, and yeah. and that I, I still take that with me now. So, you know, Nobody was assessing us on, you know, our knowledge about coronavirus, but mm-hmm. we had to learn, we had to read and learn to understand so that we could treat the patients we had in front of us at the time. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of a, a, a key take home message Tr- where you can try and learn as you're writing assignments. That's the whole point of it. Um, and kind of forget the mark that will come after it. Yes, which is really hard for us students to do, because I think. It, we're inherently as physiotherapists we're inherently sort of almost perfectionists as well and want the very best not just for our patients but for ourselves so it it becomes very hard to kind of take the focus off the marks and focus on the outcome of that are you a, a better physio or do you have a better understanding that's quite hard to do isn't it, it takes a lot of confidence yeah it does and you know example of that today I've, I've actually been working on intensive care today um, with one of my colleagues learning a bit more about smoke inhalation and it's, it's not something day to day that I treat, but, you know, listening to the teaching, looking at the presentations, looking at the literature, I'm, I'm reading it to understand it. Because mm. if I end up having to treat a patient with that, nobody's going to examine me on that information. I, I'm going to have to understand it in order to retain it and then to apply it to a patient. So, yeah, it's, it's a skill that you'll learn as you, as you lifelong learn um, <laughs> and do things like your CPD and rotations. It, it, does, it does get easier. Yeah. No, that's great. And then going on as a as a new grad, so challenges, biggest challenges you found? Yeah, I think um, I think the first biggest challenge for me was purely and simply just working full time. <laughs> I think um, throughout my GCSEs and my A levels, I'd worked alongside those in uh, in kind of waitress and bar kind of work. Um, so I was used to working hard, but it was always for kind of short, sharp, you know, chunks of uni holidays and Easter holidays and Christmas holidays. So it was a you know, two, three, four weeks at a maximum. And with placements being six weeks at a maximum. When you qualify, you get to kind of week eight and you go, oh, that's great, I'm not leaving. <laughs> I really am a physio. You get to week 10, you week 12. And at this point, nobody's really told you to take any annual leave. <laughs> yeah. Um, and like, even now, I rarely go 12 weeks without taking some leave or having a long weekend or, or having a break. Um, but I think as newly qualified, you fall into that trap of, you know, I'm at work now. So what I do is I work, um, but you're absolutely entitled. So my advice actually for new graduates is um, when you first start, don't be scared to ask for annual leave straight away. Book mm-hmm. a few weeks ahead. So, you know, once you get to week six, week eight, book a week of leave and just take that time to consolidate what you've learned in that first six to eight weeks, which is the equivalent of a placement, refresh yourself and then start again. And that's, you know, just resetting and giving your brain, your, your, you know, your poor delicate little brain that's been absolutely overwhelmed <laughs> with everything that comes with work life um, is, is probably one of the best things I can advise you to do. Um, second to that, I think, the most difficult challenge is is for me as a newly qualified was doing rotations that I hadn't experienced as a student Mm -hmm. Um, and I think prime example of that I I hadn't done a trauma or orthopedic placement as a student and that was my second rotation as a new grad and on my first day I cried Um, probably not for any other reason other than I just totally felt out, out of my depth and the, the support was there, but I probably wasn't as willing to ask for it as I would be now. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I got upset, got in a bit of a mess. But actually, within about five or six days, 
you know, I, I had acquired the knowledge I needed to. Mm -hmm. My supervisor had sat down with me and gone, right, I totally didn't appreciate you hadn't done this as a student. And it just given me the basics to run with. And then, you know, life was so much better. I also had a brilliant assistant um, called Maureen who absolutely got me through that rotation. <laughs> um, and I think that just shows, you know, your support workers are worth their weight in gold when you're a new grad. Because they run the show, really. It's not one day, it's like me. <laughs> it's yeah. assistant. 100%. I think so. I mean, from, from me picking up on both those things, I remember when you and I first first started speaking actually was when I was building up to my interview and preparing to get my job. And I remember now you telling me that about making that time to get some annual leave early on. And I remembered it straight away. And when I started, there was every intention. And I can tell you now, I'm three weeks in and I still haven't booked that annual leave. So it, it's not Talk as annual leave. Exactly, you've got to do it, but it, and it's, it's it is difficult because you get carried away and swept up in the, the everything that's going on. Um, and apart from anything else, you do feel a bit kind of like, oh, should I be asking for it now? But yeah, I think um, I'm going to do it straight away. I need to do it. So yeah, I can't can't sit here. I mean, I don't I don't know about you, Jen. But I'm I'm going to ask you a question actually. Mm -hmm. When you started work, did were you aware of how much annual leave entitlement you would get? Yeah, so I mean, my trust is, I've been incredibly impressed at how organised the trust is. So I've been, we've got a system that literally I can log on now and tell you, in fact, I can tell you I've got 179 hours left of annual leave. Yeah, sure. I mean, for, for anybody who doesn't know, when you start as a new band five, you, you know, year to year. So the annual leave year starts on the 1st of April and it goes all the way through round back to March. And in that first year, you get 27 days plus your bank holidays. Um, however, if you don't start in April, if you don't start till kind of July or August, it gets worked out as a percentage of that year. Yeah. But in a typical year, you, you get 27 days, which which works out to be five weeks plus some mm. bank holidays. So you actually have quite a lot to use. So don't be scared about using it. Yeah, I must. I was quite pleased when I saw how much annual leave we get. I was thinking, oh, that's quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so no, that's that's really good. So just to go on to the second bit you said there about the rotations as a student, I can, the one thing I'll definitely second is the, is the fact that your physio assistants or physio techs are worth their weight in gold. I'm not sure I could have got through so easily the, the first two or three weeks without the physio assistants that are on, on my ward. They have been just my, they're my rocks, I call them, because when every, everything kind of going a bit kind of crazy, I'll just turn to them and they're just there to kind of just prop you up. Um, yeah. And they know their way around the ward better than any of them because um, they've often yeah. been there for you, long. You know, time. you're good when you. Yeah, exactly. And 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 the, the way you can tell they're good is you, is you look up at, to ask them, oh, could you lift the bed up? And they've already got the remote control in their hand because yeah. they know exactly what you're about to ask them. <laughs> um, and and building that relationship is 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 really valuable. So you know, please please respect them, please value them because, like you say, they 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 know a lot. They've been working in the same places a lot, you know, a long time, and they they they've seen hundreds of band fives go through there go through their path. So. I think, yeah, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, definitely. I think that's key, the fact that they have seen countless band fives come through. So they've actually probably got a lot of skills in, in their nurturing and guidance of, of those yeah. band fives. So you won't be the yeah. first they've seen and you won't be the first to ask silly questions and there's no such thing as a silly question either. So yeah, I think yeah. that's a, a yeah. big, big tip. Um, so we, we kind of this this next question kind of goes on from that one there in terms of the favorite and least favorite rotations as a junior physio given that you ended up where you are in in the specialty when you were going yeah. through your rotations did anything stand out to you as great and not so great yeah so the answer to this is um basically everything was my favorite which was part of the problem <laughs> um so i you know i, I did lots of band five rotations i did um neuro rehab elective um orthopedics trauma uh, respiratory acute surgery critical care stroke neurology um and I, I, I think I've mentioned this on Generation HP a couple of times. Um, as a band five, I actually never did MSK outpatients. Oh. So believe it or not, you can get to a band eight without doing any MSK. Um, and that wasn't really an intentional decision. Um, I, I was down to do a, an MSK rotation and one of my peers actually really wanted it and he had a respiratory rotation. 
and he basically approached me and asked if I was willing to to do a swap see and and actually I was really keen to do respiratory I was really keen to do on calls and things like that so yeah we just um traded and then the, the rest of my career path just happened to never go through um MSK but but saying that I think I've I've done a fair job of filling that knowledge gap by you know addressing those learning needs on inpatient rotation so you know your, your mm. elective orthopedics your, your trauma rotations older adults you know ribs you know there's there's always ways to get your MSK into um into inpatient work and I think that's probably how I've ended up learning my MSK um type knowledge um I so I rotated through those those inpatient specialities and I think yeah I, I I knew straight away that I was just an inpatient therapist and to be honest I think I knew that from doing work experience before university okay yeah. I think I just immediately knew that a hospital is where I wanted to be that I like working on wards I like yeah. working with the MDT and chatting to nurses doctors problem solving yeah and I just like that immediate feedback that you get from patients rather than sending them away for a week and then them coming back um yeah. you know either know better or haven't followed the instructions you've given them um so yeah my, my satisfaction really came from all all inpatient rotations um probably my kind of lesser favorite was ended up being stroke um and that wasn't necessarily because of the the patient group um there was just issues on that rotation where you know there was there was problems with the culture on the ward patient care wasn't particularly good I, I was having to challenge a few things um I had a band six who was also having problems so it just ended up being a, a more stressful rotation than a lot mm. of the others um but equally taught me you know a lot um through the difficulties and through the bad times yeah. um so yeah so it's interesting you were saying about how you knew that inpatients was right for you early on, because I've noticed that there is a big difference in inpatients and outpatients, which may sound glaringly obvious. Yeah. But when you start working on inpatients, it's, it is things like the MDT, the stopping for a chat and grabbing someone in the corridor and having those conversations that, um, and seeing patients on a day to day basis as well. And all the prioritizing and the managing your time and things is, is, a, is, is quite different. And also you, to pick up on the bit about the MSK and using that. And I think that's something that's really important. You may be on a res medical respiratory or respiratory um, rotation or placement for that matter. But that's not to say that you're not going to use any of the MSK skills or your neuro skills or, or those. And that's what I think sets us apart as physiotherapists is the fact that we've got all these skills so if yeah. you're on a particular placement or particular rotation, that's not to say you're going to ignore all of those other ones and you can still skill up on those as well, as you yeah, said. Absolutely. And, and a classic example of that is I, I used to do a lot of work in A&E and, and take band fives with me to see patients. And yeah. I remember one patient, um, she was a lady who'd fallen out of bed overnight. She had Parkinson's disease. She had COPD. She'd fallen because she had a urinary infection. Um, she fractured her patella when she fell, so she was in a cricket splint. Um, so actually, in order to assess her, you needed to know a bit of neuro to, to work out Parkinson's wise where she was at. Yeah. You needed to know a bit of respiratory because you know it turns out she also had a bit of a chest infection. You know, a bit of you know T and O in terms of weight bearing and teaching. You know, teaching which walking aid are you going to give this lady with Parkinson's who's got no arm swings and all those kind of things. Yeah. Um, but, but people really find it difficult to, to tap into lots of bits, bits of knowledge. They, they do tend to go, oh, I'm on a respiratory placement or rotation. I need to do a respiratory assessment. Mm. Actually, everything else comes along with it, doesn't it? So. Mm. I think it's really hard, isn't it, to draw upon all those different things? Because as students, you, you focus on one thing and you, you just it's hard enough sometimes just to kind of get everything you need to know about that one thing, um, yeah. let alone having to draw upon all of the others and something you might have done two years ago and you're having to think about it now so it's not it's never going to come quickly but it's something yeah to try and do if you can <laughs> yeah it's it, it's a, yeah it's a skill that you will you will develop you, you can't not develop it <laughs> um so yeah you know bit by bit you'll add you'll add to your toolbox and you'll start assessing much more comprehensively rather than going in for mm. you know very specific assessment methods 
down you get yeah you get more out of your treatment so you we've, we've this is quite nice actually because we started going through your rotations there and I, I think it'd be really nice to know because we don't necessarily come across loads of physios at band eight positions um and i think it's always good for us coming in as a band five to know that those band eight positions are there to be to be grabbed um and there's i think am i right in saying it's probably happening more and more we're seeing more band eight positions and more sort of consultant physio positions as well coming up um it'd be really nice to know sort of how you got there and what what made you keep keep going up the ladder to get there yeah sure um yeah you are right that there, there is there is posts out there things are always changing things are always being restructured so um you know it, the Queen Elizabeth, we have quite a lot of clinical specialists and dates. We have myself that leads older adults. We have a couple of respiratory lead um, band dates. We have a, a major trauma band date. We have, you know, outpatient um, leads in, you know, upper limb, lower limb. So, yeah, the, the post is definitely there. I think it varies slightly trust to trust across the country. But obviously for most of you, this is at least probably 10 years 10 years off your radar just yet but I imagine by that point if if the attitude towards allied health professionals continues the way it is then you know AHPs will be hugely respected hugely valued people will recognize what we can do from a from a service and clinical lead perspective and I think yeah you'll you'll be in a really good position to mm. to become very expert in, in a particular area if that's what you choose to do um in terms of how I got here, I, I ask myself that every day. Um, I so I so I I did my band five rotations. Um, I actually spent probably longer being a band five than most people do now. So I was a band five for about three three and a half years, something like that. Um, and I there was a new service being set up in in my trust, which was a kind of an admission prevention type service. At, the front door in A and E and assessment units, and um, I decided I was I was well placed to take on that band six role. You know, I had a lot of rotational experience, and I could apply that to whatever came through the front door in A and E. So I I went into that band six post and, and worked with a, a very good service lead who um, I'm still in touch with now, and um, that was both excellent and um, very soul destroying at times setting up a new service and um, I remember there was a, a consultant who worked on the assessment unit who I mean very much a character but it got to the point where he referred every patient on AMU to um, physiotherapy uh, before sending them home basically because he wanted it as a tick box exercise he wanted to be certain that you know that person's level of function and independence was appropriate to go home Right. But in the same breath, he would also discharge them home before I'd seen them. <laughs> so it, it, it just it just turned into a bit of a cascade of me running around like a headless chicken. We were a very small team at the time. I was the only person on that ward. Um, and AMU was about 40 beds, something like that. Um, so, yeah, very difficult time, but very much led to a lot of growth for me professionally and personally. So... Um, excellent opportunity mm. um, through doing that work that's where a lot of the older adult influence came from um, I knew I wanted to work in inpatients I knew I liked a lot of rotations and a lot of specialities but I kind of came to realize that the common denominator was was older people because they come in with all of these conditions all at the same time mm. and you can't separate them out you have to use everything that you know um, so, so that's kind of where my passion for older adults kind of came from really. And I, I was getting frustrated that a lot of my peers were going on, you know, bow bath courses because they were interested in stroke and neuro, you know, my outpatient peers were going on um, society of acute medicine courses and acupuncture and all those kind of things. And I thought, hang on a minute, what, I haven't decided to do either of those things, but what, what learning and development is there for me? Um, and that kind of led me to, to look, go and look for external courses. And I found a few on kind of dementia, delirium, older adults management. Um, and from that, I ended up doing a master's module in, in dementia care. Um, I, you know, spent a lot of time doing my people management type skills to how to supervise people, how to manage sickness, how to 
you know get the best out of students how to fail students unfortunately and um, comes with part of the job and yeah I very much got used to kind of managing myself managing a ward managing other people so that's where my kind of team leadership role then then came in and I, I progressed into a band seven role um which was then a a band seven team lead across two hospitals so I was having to juggle two a and e's you know a big team yeah a team yeah. that worked shifts so you know they weren't all in together I couldn't do your standard in-service training program once a week mm -hmm. um because the staff weren't there so it, it led to having to think quite innovatively about you know how do I how do I train people how do I teach people how do we have team meetings mm. um and from there I did a postgraduate degree in in healthcare leadership um which I think you, you tuned into the CSP students um live on leadership didn't you so mm. you know it's the a hot topic it has been for a while now but I can I can safely say that that came at a very well timed um, point in my career whereby it gave me lots of skills to to take my career forward um, and probably at that point I realized how much influence I could have over other people other people's learning and um, changing services you know I, I knew that these patients weren't getting a good deal not just in my trust but anywhere like nationally we, mm -hmm. we know that the nhs struggles to cope with the amount of older adults that need the services yeah. um so so that's kind of what ended up making me pursue a band eight role because i i wanted some more clout and some more power mm. to to change things and to be an influence and do what i knew was right um so at that point I decided to move trusts and, and, and take on a band eight role in a in a much larger trust with different challenges, meet different people, network with different professionals. And and again, that's that's been brilliant for my development. I think people underestimate how moving jobs can be an absolute asset to you. There's right. there's sometimes a lot of negativity about people who move every two or three years, but yeah. I think actually in your career that's that's something that will add to your own your knowledge and your networking mm. massively so I, I would encourage you to to move around it if that's what you you choose to do yeah I, th I think um the last thing just to mention which is is something I was going to come on to later is I I, I became a band eight at um 29 years old okay um, and I I sometimes reflect back and think what was the rush kind of right what was I right to to pursue that so tenaciously mm. um, and I, I think it's both right and wrong in equal measure um, I think that's probably just the type of personality I am because I enjoy learning and I, I'm you know intrigued by everything physio related so um, you know yes I have gone down a certain career path but you know I've got 30 odd years of my career left yeah. and you know, the world is my oyster. I think um, I think you were listening to Rachel Moses when she was talking to mm -hmm. the CSP students as well, and she was talking about, you know, I've done this in my career, then I did this, then I did this, then I did this, then I did this. So I think I'm probably at the point where I, I very much have the attitude of building a portfolio and that jumping around between specialities and, you know, doing a bit of teaching, doing a bit of research, I have the freedom to do what I want to do. So, mm -hmm. you know, being a band eight doesn't mean that forever. I can still take any which direction that I choose to take. And take on the challenges and, and things like that. I think, and it's the same as a student is I've always, always promoted sort of grabbing opportunities and taking opportunities and, and being inquisitive and seeing what's out there. I think it, that never stops by the sounds of it. No, never stops. <laughs> no, no. Um, but at the same time, I think you've touched on there is it's potentially easy as a band five to start looking, okay, right. How can I get to band eight? And that's not necessarily the most effective way of managing your career. Maybe sometimes it's actually sort of, sort of being more in the moment. And I know for myself, that's very much a case of just sort of saying, okay, band five, I've got a lot to learn. Let's soak all that in. Let's ignore kind of what's going to happen in, in a couple of years time for now and just kind of focus on the moment where I am. I think uh, as students, we can get carried away with where we're going to be in X amount of years sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And like you, you've got time and, and make the most of it, you know, um, going up the bands comes with a lot of responsibility. 
mm. um, which is is both a, a blessing and a curse in yeah. in equal measure. Yeah. And you know, I think when I look back at all those you know moves in my career, I don't regret any of them. The reason that they happened is because they felt right at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and if they feel right at the time to you, absolutely go ahead and pursue them. Yeah. Something to be aware of is that nationally at the moment there there is a bit of a shortage of band sixes, mm-hmm. um, a combination of kind of less grads coming through, people leaving the profession to go travelling, you know, people taking career breaks, that kind of thing. And as a result, what you can sometimes see is band fives being, you know, coerced into taking band six roles perhaps a little bit prematurely and some of them cope with it absolutely fine you know they they perform at the level they're being asked to perform at whereas others really struggle with it because actually it was a a bit of a big jump and a a little bit too soon Mm. so you know if if you're being considered for a band six post have a have a real think about what it's whether it's what you want or not or whether it's because people are telling you that you're brilliant and that you should go for it which feels lovely at the time because it's a compliment Mm. Um, but actually, if that's not what you, not what you want, then, and you want a bit more time, band six jobs, band seven jobs, they will always be coming up. There is literally no rush. <laughs> yeah, I think it's looking at a bit more holistically those band six roles and thinking, okay, it's, you know, it's not just about being a great physio at that stage. It's about some of your people skills and your personal. You're dealing with difficult situations and potentially dealing with situations that aren't going to be comfortable to deal with. And are you ready for that side of things as well as? The, the being an experienced physio side of things so it's it's taking it all in and having a good old think but uh, yeah. and i suppose and and also on that i i maybe would say recommend just talking to other band sixes before you take the role and sort of talk to them about what's involved and what have they found hard and not and things like that as well before yeah. making the leap yeah sure and and you know it'll vary trust to trust but some yeah. trusts have static band sixes so mm-hmm. once you become a band six that's it you're, you've become a specialist and you mm. you tend to stay in that band six role um whereas you know other trusts they have a band six rotational program so you know the band six is at my current trust they rotate every nine months so mm. the rotations are longer they have opportunity to to do more you know do more detail do projects and audits and research and that kind of stuff but um again if that's not what you want and you don't want to move every six months that's not the right thing for you either so yeah. exactly yeah so it's, it's taking everything that might change into account so kind of now we come on to so the crux of the, the this question came in about how to prepare for working um, on healthcare of the elderly which we're going to talk about in a second um and it's yeah. a placement so this is a someone's coming through they, they've got a placement coming up on a busy acute hospital and it's on healthcare of the elderly looking at how they might prepare for that before we do that, should we touch on the the use of the word care of the elderly and, and your thoughts around that? Yeah, sure. So um, kind of elderly care, health care of elderly, it, it very much fell out of vogue, you know, about three, four years ago. Um, predominantly because it, it, it's not a particularly nice term to call somebody elderly. It, you know, there's connotations of lacking respect and that, you know they don't deserve the attention that perhaps we we know that they should do um so yeah i mean the uh, british geriatric society you know they if you look at their twitter they have lots of information on, on their website about mm-hmm. you know rephrasing it to become older adults or older people um as a as a much more respectful terminology to, to those groups and what you'll find is that a lot of trusts are changing that terminology now so you know at my trust we're, we're not known as care of the elderly anymore we're known as healthcare for older people um, and you know front door services we have a, a team called opal which stands for older persons assessment and liaison and um, mm-hmm. social services you know outside of the nhs social care providers they are calling them older adults now um, and it, it comes back to that use of the word, word frailty, James, which is yeah. that frailty isn't necessarily defined by your age. Mm-hmm. Frailty, you know, consists of a group of syndromes and you can be frail at 50 yeah. or you yeah. can be really fit as a fiddle 80 year old. So, you know, the fact that you're an older person doesn't necessarily define what your level of function is, what your level of health is, um, you know, and how well you're getting on in life. So, yeah, it's just a much more politically correct version of the terminology yeah definitely i think it's a good one for students going into 
into their careers to start off with start with the right terminology straight away yeah and it's something i've noticed and it's some something that i've got in my head as a as a change to make as well so <laughs> we shall see watch this space so kind of <laughs> going back Fly to the that, flag down south for me <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> um so going back to the question so preparing for a placement in that setting in a busy acute hospital how, what kind of advice would you have for someone in that situation? yeah sure so I think the, I mean, it depends what your other placement experience and, and work experiences may be been, but I think that the first thing to get comfortable with is people who have communication difficulties. Um, you, I'm guessing James, you've already found this in your, your first few days at work. Um, a lot of our older adults patients, they either have, you know, hearing deficit, visual deficit, speech deficit from, you know, old strokes or Mm -hmm. you know, different surgeries or anything they might have had and I think what people often are scared to do with older adults is just speak to them like they're a person yeah. Yeah. you know they they have interests they like watching certain things on the television they have hobbies they used to have a career like please please just ask them about it yes. treat them as though they're a person um and you know if they're having difficulty hearing find a way around it whether that's, you know, sometimes I, I use my whoops, I use my phone um, and, I, and I'll type out things to them if, if their hearing isn't very good, but their vision is fine. Handwritten with a piece of paper. We have um, on our wards at Queen Elizabeth, we have um, kind of communication aid boxes on every mm -hmm. ward and they have kind of headsets and earphones and things so that you can communicate with people with difficulties. We have um, kind of... Uh, communication boards from speech and language therapy so you know if if really needed they can just point to I want the toilet or I, I want the drink or yeah whatever it might be um and and with that there there are some people who who don't communicate um you know you you really advanced dementia patients they they have just lost the ability um and it's knowing what to do about that so I would deliberately speak to your educators or supervisors in your case james and and say to them i'm finding it very difficult to communicate with this patient could you come with me because i'd like to see how you you know how you do this yeah. um send me messages on generation ahp that's absolutely fine as well because mm. it'll be you know patient by patient specific but um yeah i think people get into that trap of feeling like they can't have a bit of a laugh and a joke um you know my I have a few stock phrases that I, I do reuse. If you work with me, anybody watching, you'll you'll notice them. But you know, if, if, if I've got an older lady who's talking to me about her husband and, and unfortunately he's passed away, and you know, you can you can hear the conversation kind of it's about to do this because it's like, oh, he, he died. Mm. Um I, I tend to ask, you know, was he handsome? Where did you find him? Yeah. You know, those kind of things to to bring her back into the room of it, it doesn't need to be a sad thing that you're telling me about his hus about your husband and he's right. passed away. It's, you know, where did you meet him? How many children did you have together? You know, was he a good dad? All of those reminiscent, really like positive ways of thinking yeah. about somebody who's, who's passed away. Um, mm. And something else from a kind of dementia point of view, I get asked a lot when dementia patients are perhaps not, not communicating in an appropriate way so example being um you know i had a gentleman a few weeks ago who he thought his parents were alive but he was 92 so you know they're very clearly not alive mm. people are really uncertain about whether to correct him yeah and yeah. potentially cause him distress mm -hmm. or whether to go along with him and yet you know that doesn't quite feel right either um and, and it does come down to what is distressing for the patient. So for some patients, I will correct them because they can be reorientated. They, you, nice. they can understand with some help where they are, how old they are, that actually that you're thinking about your parents and they died years ago and they'll be okay with it. So you can reorientate them to the setting that they're in, yeah. whereas others would be really distressed by that. So it is a bit of trial and error. Mm -hmm. don't be scared to do one or the other neither of them is right or wrong it is individual to that patient and it might be helpful to speak to family members because you know if, if they do that at home all the time what do the family do about it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do they get out photos of the parents so that they can you know remember them without becoming distressed or yeah you know what else might they do so that's that's my first tip really kind of get comfortable with um 
not being quite sure how to communicate but but working it out build a relationship with that patient mm. from a from a reading kind of an, a knowledge perspective mm. i i would definitely look at the nice guidelines for balls and um delirium because that will be about 80 percent of your caseload yeah um and i would look at um I, you can you can search this quite easily on Google. I would look up comprehensive geriatric assessment CGA. You'll find a lot of information on that on the um, British Geriatric Society's website. And within that, you'll find something called the Rockwood Clinical Frailty Scale. Mm -hmm. um, and we're coming back to that word frailty again, James. But um, the the clinical frailty scale is basically an objective marker. So it objectifies how frail is this person. Um, and it basically goes through right from, you know, somebody who's older, but is very independent, very active, self-caring, living their best life, mm -hmm. um, right through to somebody who's terminally ill and um, it is, is probably the end of life um, and everything in between. So, you know, frame users, people who need care, people who live in 24 hour care. So it's a really good comprehensive measure and it basically just brings somebody out as a number. Yeah. Um, and it, it it may or may not influence how you choose to treat them so it, it becomes important um with you know decision making like this person's been in hospital for three weeks already we've been trying to rehabilitate them we haven't really got very far they still can't stand up and they you know before admission they were walking with a frame what am i going to do with this person now you know if i send them to a rehabilitation bed or center or ward yeah is that going to change their outcome or actually was their frailty score before admission indicating that, you know, they really weren't doing well before they had lots of frailty syndromes, you know, rehabilitation yeah. potential, which is banded around a lot, yeah. um, you know, might be limited. So yeah, it, it's just a really helpful, helpful tool. Um, and you'll mm. see medics using it as well. It, it's not, it's not just a therapy um, therapy measure. Mm. Mm. I think, yeah. um, I think it's really, I, I went for, oh, I think it was on my first, first placements, I think it was, and we did a talk on frailty and that, that ability for someone to ret get back to baseline while, whilst after being knocked off. And there's a nice graph, I think it was. Um, yeah, it's on, it. it's on my page if people want to see it. Yeah, it talks, so, so frailty really, for anyone who doesn't know, is, is, is a loss of physiological reserve. So mm. you, you've often got multi-organ, multi-system um, health concerns. You know, falls is part of a frailty syndrome, delirium, dementia, incontinence, poor nutrition and hydration. So if somebody's already showing those signs, it's a sign that something in their body isn't quite isn't quite going well and, and that yeah. the aging process is very much in full swing. Um, and I don't know if you've come across the phrase sarcopenia, mm -hmm. um, James, which is a, a loss of muscle mass associated with frailty. Um, it's often assessed with grip strength. Mm. um but but again if you know the rate of muscle loss if you're in a hospital bed for for a week as an 80 year old is is substantial so um it's this is where the the theory behind older adults in physio becomes just as interesting as your respiratory knowledge your msk knowledge it's it's just a specialist to work out what is going on with this older adult yeah. how many of their organs aren't working properly mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and it, it definitely gives you a clue so other things i'd you know before you go on any ward really um older adults or not is get on top of your observations so make sure you know your normal values for you know blood pressure heart rate temperature sats etc yeah. um and if you can take a look at some blood results so what what normal blood results are because james yeah. i'm sure you've you've seen a lot of your patients so far they're being treated for urinary tract infections yeah. you know community acquired pneumonia mm -hmm. um low sodium yeah. dehydration constipation mm -hmm. but but the blood results the blood results tell you a lot um about how acutely ill that person is whether yeah. you're going to touch them whether you're going to get them out of bed what tests they're waiting for mm -hmm. so yeah if you've got any um any time before or during placement yeah. have a look at some good results 
helps you with in, in your MDT meetings as well. So if you have your, the, the, the doctors and the consultants are always talking about blood results and yeah, CRP. CRP. And like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. So it just having, you don't need to, I don't you need to know the ins and outs and this real detailed phys, uh, physiology behind it, but having, as you say, what's good, what's not so good. And what yeah. does it necessarily mean for, for them as a presentation, that, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, certainly. Yeah. Be- I mean, my, most most trust uh, my trust is electronic now. So if you mm-hmm. bring if you bring up the page with blood results on, it will also give you the normal values. Yeah. Um, so you don't have to go about remembering like exactly what the normal value is. <laughs> but if you're not electronic as a trust or um, on placement, you could you know create yourself a little crib sheet, and yeah. keep it in your pocket, or keep it yeah. in a little notebook. Just so in MBT, when you hear them saying, "Oh, he's got a CRP of 300." you can look in your little book and go oh that's really high <laughs> yikes what what does that mean um yeah. and then you can start asking the right question definitely definitely and then you i think it also enables you to have um a, a kind of a knowledgeable discussion with the mdt as well so you you know you can i'm now starting to get to that point where i'm quite happy now going up to the consultant and just talking through the patient with the consultant and it's amazing how they how they respond to that as well and that helps our profession yeah. as well i think that really does and and yeah. something i've noticed is is the respect that physios have got in that mdt um it's quite a crucial role yeah. um, so i think it's yeah nosy yeah G- geriatricians generally they are a wonderful bunch and they're all very pro therapy mm-hmm. so you know get a good relationship them with them whether you're a student or a new band five go up to them introduce yourself and say i'm really keen to learn from you you know can i come on a ward round with you can i come and do a clinic with you can i you know spend time with one of your junior doctors have you got any junior doctor teaching i could come to you know all of those kind of things that they're just as much of an asset to your learning as your physiotherapy like in service training is or your supervisor from physio um so yeah kind of go up to them and say i'm interested in your clinical area and they'll love you (laughs) <laughs> yeah that's a really good idea actually i think um f- yeah it, it, it's, it's proper mdt or, or as i put interprofessional working it's that really really close-knit working working together not just being in the same room together and there's yeah. a there's a big and it, yeah and it it definitely evolves because you know I, we have patients who they they've come into hospital having fallen and um, they have pain in their hip they have a uh, an x-ray and the x-ray is normal they get brought to the ward, but they're still having pain in their hip. Mm-hmm. And the consultant turns around to us and says, oh, can you try and get them up and about? Try and wait bear. And if there's still a problem, let me know and I'll do a CT scan. Mm. So they are asking us to inform their treatment plan. Mm-hmm. And often, you know, I've had to go back to them and go, they, they cannot load that limb. The pain is disproportionate to a soft tissue injury. Yeah. I am I am certain there is something else going on here. Mm-hmm. And then yeah, the C T comes back with a, a fractured neck of femur that was missed on the X ray or that you know just couldn't be seen, or something like a pubic ray my fracture that, mm-hmm. that the X ray couldn't pick up either. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, it, it's very much a two way process in, in older adults' care and that's something else I really enjoy about about the post. Yeah, definitely. But I think it's it's being proactive in that process as well though. I think it's very easy to and, and I don't think it should be found upon necessarily when you're early on in the days is to sort of sit back and just listen which I think is great um, but if you start getting involved you get so much more and sometimes for me I found it quite hard but I've kind of said like come on James no, like, go on go and talk to so and so and you do and then you get so much back um, and it creates yeah. that relationship which is great really really good yeah um, something, I've done, something I've done with my teams in the past I, I've, I've called Friday fun time Friday mm-hmm. and I've basically yeah. said Go out and onto your wards and go and do something you wouldn't normally do. Go and have fun. Go and spend time with somebody else. Go and follow a consultant on ward round. Yeah. You know, go and create a little quiz that we can do at lunchtime. Let's let's have fun with our profession rather than feeling under pressure all the time and mm-hmm. you know feeling this desire to perform and just constantly churn mm-hmm. through the patients. Let's yeah. actually enhance our learning experience. Mm, absolutely, yeah. Another thing to add on on what you, you were talking about, the, the um, communicating with older adults as well. And just today, I got very much told off by, by one of my patients for shouting. 
So yeah. um, the, the response was, you don't need to shout, dear. You just need to speak to the right ear. <laughs> Um, and I think that kind of another trick. The, the the earlier that you can get used to putting hearing aids into people, the better. Yes. It's like putting socks on a toddler. Once you've nailed it, <laughs> you've nailed it. But um, hearing aids and dentures. As soon as you you've got the knack of getting those in, you, you know they'll love you forever. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely, uh, yeah. It's especially if you're taking someone's oxygen of their nasal cannula off, and you take their hearing aid out by accident, and then you're thinking, yeah. "How do I put this back in?" <laughs> yeah, there must be a YouTube video on it. If there isn't, I'll do one. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think you should. Yeah, I think, I'm sure there is one. But yeah, um, so that's that's fantastic. And that's, and there's a few links there. All of the links that we talk about, I'll make sure are in the description underneath the YouTube video as well. That we've mentioned there with the CGA, nice and the the um, BG, BGC, BGS, sorry, as well. Um, so the next, the next one was talking about first rotations on med rehab or medical rehab and how to prepare and what to expect. Is there anything to add to what you've already sort of said there? Yeah, well, yeah. I think um, for those of you that have followed Generation HP kind of from early on, um, you, you'll find a story highlight that's talking about um, frames. Zimmer frames and, and me getting quite angry about this. I don't know if you uh, remember it, James, but um, I think it, in all inpatient wards, particularly kind of medical wards and older adult wards, please, please, please think twice about why somebody is using a Zimmer frame or a relator frame. Um, the, the premise of them is that they're supposed to be an aid. They are not supposed to be your treatment. Okay unless somebody's a long-term user and then you know that's how they've come in but time and time again i see junior physiotherapists on their medical ward they go and assess a new patient they do a very nice subjective history you know they tell me all about how many falls this person's had and xyz when they actually go to treat the patient they stand them up they walk them with the frame they walk them back and they sit them back down again and that is their treatment. That to me is not treatment. If, if that person doesn't normally use a frame, mm -hmm. you should be treating them to find out what the cause of them needing the frame is. So please go back to your real basics of what is their static quad like? Can they straight leg raise? What is their glute activity like? You know, what's their sit to stand like? Are they compensating anywhere? Can they stand unsupported? Can they single leg stand? Mm. you know if they're if they're standing with their eyes closed what's their balance like please go back to your absolute basics of assessment rather than doing what probably you know a lot of nhs hospitals are, are turning physio into at the moment which is you know get them up get them walking get them home yeah if you don't know what people's problems are you can't if you just stand someone up walk them and put them back down again you cannot write a problem list not one that's good anyway um you know you don't know where their deficit is you don't know why they've been falling every week at home you know you don't know why their balance is impaired you don't know that they've got oa in one knee and it's really painful and that it gives way sometimes so back to our premise of older adults deserve you know the right treatment the right respect if you if you had a, a 30 year old that was coming into our patient saying i'm falling over every week you'd yeah. go bloody hell what's going on here like let's yeah. do a neuro assessment let's check your strength let's check check your proprioception just because they're 80 doesn't mean, you know, 80, 90, 100. Yeah. Um, please don't treat them any differently. You know, try and find a root cause. And if you can't, speak to your supervisor or educator about it and say, I don't know why this person's falling. But mm. you should be worried that someone falls over every, every week or, you know, however many times in a year. Yeah. The, the mortality from hip fracture or, mm -hmm. you know, subdural hematomas, if someone falls and, and hurts themselves, you know, these patients die. So actually, if you haven't done a, a good falls assessment, well, you know, you've got the opportunity that in hospital, yeah, <laughs> they've yeah. got you on the ward, you use the opportunity to assess them really thoroughly because it might, it might change the course of their treatment. I think that's, I think that's really, really important. And yeah, I think it's something, it's something that's for me as well to take away straight into tomorrow um, is, is kind of remembering our skills as a physio at the end of the day um and yeah. and also it's not normal for someone to be falling over at any age just because they're of a certain age that doesn't necessarily mean oh that's okay that that's normal they're 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 90 
um, that still look at why. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you might find reasons that are irreversible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if you've got somebody with a, a, a peripheral neuropathy because they're diabetic and they can't feel their feet, you know, I know it's a problem and I know it's a, probably a huge contributing factor to why they're falling, but I cannot reverse the irreversible damage that's been done to their nerves through diabetes. Mm -hmm. But what I can think about is, is there any compensation that I can give for that? You know, what's their footwear like? Yeah. Are they better in bare feet or are they better in footwear? Mm -hmm. You know, lots of, of diabetic patients aren't supposed to walk around in bare feet because they get risk of getting wounds on their feet and then, you know, poor healing and, and causes other complications. But if they never get wounds, but they do fall all the time, you've got to weigh up kind of yeah. which one's which one's more important. Um, yeah. So, yeah, lots lots of things like that, really. Um, doing good assessments. And I, and, I, and I plan to do more content on this on, on Generation HP. So, you know, if you're coming across difficulties... Yeah let me know and I'll, um, I'll address it bit by bit. Perfect. Perfect. I think that's a, a massive takeaway. Massive. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's a call out. If anyone's seeing that happening, I'd be really interested to hear, hear about it. Um, and if you think if anyone's watching this and they're, they're working on a medical rehab ward and they're not doing it, they, they are doing the basis and they are, they've got a good service. It'd be really nice to hear about it as well. Actually, it'd be good to hear about the positives out yeah. there. So, so that'd be really good to know, to know as well. I think, I mean, I, just before we move on, I can give mm. you a really good patient example I came across a few months ago. So um, an older lady, um, she'd come into A&E because she'd fallen, she'd fractured her wrist and um, the, the front door service sent her out to a rehab uh, unit because she was a frame user. And now that her wrist was in a cast, she could no longer use the frame. And it meant that, you know, she couldn't really mobilise independently. She, she fell again while she was at the rehab unit and came back to hospital, had a urine infection, so stayed in for a few days and ended up on a medical ward, assessed by physio there, and by this point the, the plaster had come off so they could start using the frame with her. Got her using the frame, went home with some support, both care and therapy. A few days later at home she fell again, she came back to A&E, she fractured her um, neck of femur went for surgery, uh, ended up on the rehabilitation ward at our hospital. And when I look back at all of the notes of all of these, this input that she'd had, not one person, not one therapist had done a balance assessment with this lady. Yeah. And yet she was falling over repeatedly and not only falling over, falling over and sustaining injury. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So without a plan for how, we, what we were going to do about her balance, we were, we were, you know, dooming her to, repeated admissions repeated fractures it was very clear her bone density was terrible mm. um and yeah we we were the key people in that 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 could have done better but my attitude to learning is that we learn from that and make it better for the next yeah. patients that follow you know nobody gets hung drawn and quartered for that it's about what what pressures were on your time what mm -hmm. assessment pro forma wasn't in place is our electronic note system working because it didn't prompt you to do that assessment and all those kind of things. It's about looking at the systems to stop that happening again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, I think that's, I think that's really good. It certainly got me thinking that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what it's about. It's about reflecting back and it's about thinking, okay, I'm hearing this now and I'm thinking, okay, so over the last three weeks, what have my assessments been like? Have they been good enough? Have they been good enough for my patients? Um, and I'm not afraid to say it. I'd yeah. say no, they haven't been. Um, so I think it's it's, yeah. it's great we're having this conversation. So I think it's, it's brilliant. Um, yeah. and, and that's nothing to be ashamed of. But I suppose mm. that, that if you go back to your assistants and your you know your band threes and band fours, if they are doing the same thing when they go and see the patient as you are, there's probably something wrong. Yeah. Because you're supposed to be clinically more expert than them. And, and you know, you're brand new to the post, so you, you might not be yet, but it's about working towards being more expert than them. Yes. What can I add to this patient on top of what the assistant did with them yesterday? Because yeah. if I'm going to do exactly the same thing, why am I here? The yeah. ward could be run by assistants. Yeah. And we don't, we, yeah, exactly. There needs to be sort of a, a reason. Yeah. No, yeah. agreed. Um, so then we've got the next one of, of top tips for working with older adults. May I put in brackets, maybe covered above. Is there anything in addition? 
no i think i think we've covered yeah. i think we've covered the most part i think um for anybody who watched um clinical physios live with me a couple of months ago we spoke about prioritization mm. uh, and that's probably the last thing to touch on i i won't prioritize a ward in the same way that somebody else might because i prioritize people who have the highest need so rather than getting pulled into the nhs constant churn of get them up get them walking get them home you know actually if people aren't far off their baseline do they do they need to see me the person that really needs to see me is the person who needs assistance of two to get out of bed when normally they're independent and self-caring yeah because they, they are the ones that are the most impaired so it you know you have to weigh up who who's medically fit who's a new patient but also who is at their worst at the moment compared to where they were yeah yeah because they're the ones you know that need our skill the most don't they 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 need that and then that goes back to that proper assessment to be able to create a proper problem list to be able to then create a proper treatment plan yeah if if you're just going to walk someone with a frame but the nurses are already walking them with a frame to the toilet um what we had yeah yeah you might you might you might need to do an assessment and do you know a bit of a deep dive to to check that things aren't being missed but you know the bulk of your time you know these poor patients get left in the bed and i I i've heard countless stories of patients coming into hospital being mobile and self-caring and leaving as a hoist Mm. and it it breaks my heart because i think Mm. you know there will be a percentage of those patients who unfortunately their clinical history whatever's happened in that admission unfortunately has rendered them hoist bound but there's a good chunk of them where i think actually if if from a physiotherapy point of view stuff had been done differently could could we have changed that outcome yeah and you might have only changed them from a hoist to transferring out of bed with assistance of two but that's massively different for a patient yeah and the, the amount of dignity you keep someone from from not being hoisted is yeah. is considerable. And you you only have to be hoisted yourself to realise that. And I, that's just something else as well. Where I did my manual handling training recently, and I think um, if you haven't been hoisted, or you haven't been SARA steadied or rotor, you know, red returned, you it has to be done. You have to kind of to to realise how important it is to try and keep someone, you know, at the most independent of their abilities. I think it's important. So. Maybe. yeah definitely okay so this is this next question um i think this came from chloe um chloe dooley so i'm just gonna uh, yeah. this question coming through so what would you do differently if anything if you were to start out as a band five again I, this is a great question it is and it it does seem like years ago it was 2009 that i graduated so um you know, going back all that way would, do you know what? I'd actually love to go back to the beginning. I'd actually love to go back to the beginning of university um, Mm -hmm. and do my degree all over again. Because I think I probably took in about 20% of what they taught me (laughs) (laughs) because I just think you're, I I just think you're, you're, well, my brain at, you know, 18, 19, 20 was only capable of certain things. My my brain now is very different. So I think if you put me through an undergraduate degree now, I'd, I'd, Mm -hmm gain a lot more from it yeah um i think okay so if i went back i think um you you mentioned this earlier james you talked about perfection i think Mm -hmm. i would um be kinder to myself and try not to be perfect all the time and i definitely haven't been (laughs) um but just putting that pressure on yourself it 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 doesn't help anyone Mm -hmm. if you've if you've got you know a, a good head on your shoulders you will work your way through your career in a you know in a way that is appropriate to your level of learning your level of knowledge what else is going on in your life at that time you know some points in my career I I haven't spent all year learning with my head in a book because I've had other stuff going on and other years you're the most motivated you've ever been and you you try super hard so it will ebb and it will flow but don't try and be perfect would be one of my tips Mm -hmm. um I think I would um, I would be less scared of doing what is right rather than what's easiest. And by that, I mean, um, it's often quite uncomfortable to challenge certain things. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example of, of when I was a band five. So 
I, I walked onto a ward that, um, that wasn't my ward, it, it was one of the other wards that a peer of mine was looking after. And I walked onto the ward and there was a, a lady sat in a wheelchair at the end of her bed, probably about 50 years old, and um, she was unresponsive. And I didn't, I didn't know this patient. I didn't know um, any of her medical history. I didn't, I didn't know her name, to be quite frank. Um, but, but the first thing I did was, was pull the emergency alarm, shout for help, um, get staff to the area that I was in, and you know, do what you do in an emergency situation, which is get her back on the bed, you know, start observations, get some high flow oxygen on her, X, Y, Z. Um, but in that time, a consultant came flying out of the office and, um, I mean, it, in the politest possible way, really, la really laid into me for calling the emergency alarm because he was in the office and that I should have just gone to get him. So having just walked onto that ward, I didn't know he was in the office. The door was closed. I don't know the patient. I, you know, I did what I felt was right at the time. Um, I ended up in, you know, in tears. I had the the emergency response team trying to console me and um, really try to reassure me that what I'd done was was the right thing. But um, I, afterwards, I I felt I felt slightly kind of hung out to dry for the fact that I'd I'd tried to do the right thing for the patient. So mm. I, I actually ended up having a conversation with the consultant. Um, who who came to apologise later, and uh, I made it quite clear how how they'd made me feel. But time and time again, I've seen things in my career where I I haven't agreed with them, or I don't think, or I'm not sure that it's right. I could take the easy option and say nothing, and yeah. not get involved, and not stick your head above the parapet, and you know, for for fear of what what consequences would happen. But it part of my professional identity and, and you know a lot of my colleagues and good physios they they will speak up for what they feel is right and that doesn't have to be aggressive you, you know no. you don't have to be angry about it you can just say I, I've overheard you speaking like this to a patient could we discuss it because the way I've interpreted it is is perhaps not how you meant it to sound mm -hmm. um you know I, I've come across a HGA who, who I've overheard a you know, saying to an older lady, oh, for God's sake, shut up. But the patient had a really severe dementia and wouldn't have understood, you know, she, the HA claimed it was banter. It, it really didn't come across like that. But having those conversations are really difficult at the time. Um, but it, it really sets you up to, to know what your principles are as a physiotherapist. So that's, mm. that's what I'd probably recognise if I started again. I'd, I'd try and recognise that much earlier on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that patient advocacy, isn't it? It's um, as well, which I think I think what I would have just add it is really hard. And I think when you're new yeah. and when you're just starting out, or it is very difficult to even if you hear something or overhear something or see a process that you just don't think is right, having that uh, that confidence to be able to to speak up. I think you hit the nail on the head there. Whereas it doesn't have to be aggressive. You don't have to be confrontational to to do that. Yeah it's um it can be a clinical conversation at the end of the day yeah absolutely and you know it it can be really tiny things like you know the amount of times i've gone to patients who've got oxygen on and yet the oxygen isn't on at the wall um and i don't i don't know who's turned it off i don't know why i you know i doubt it was malicious but it is a clinical incident that patient has been without oxygen for i don't know how long yeah and they're now they've now clinically deteriorated as a result so I have a professional responsibility to do something about that. And, mm -hmm. and often that will come in the form of a, an incident report, you know, speaking to the nurse in charge or a ward manager to say, you know, I've, I've noticed this. I understand it. It probably didn't come from any malice, but we need to address this. When was the last time your ward had any kind of oxygen training or emergency training? Is there anything I can help with? Is there any teaching sessions you'd like me to do? Yeah. So what you need to do is is kind of offer to be part of the solution. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. And and that kind of in itself shows that you're not aggressively trying to point fingers and, no. and you know be accusatory or, or or give any blame to anybody. But you know it goes back to that multi-professional working isn't it yeah. if i've got a responsibility to make sure everybody else is practicing safely yeah. because i hope that if i did that that somebody would tell me 
and I've been told multiple times by nurses oh you've left the bed rails up <laughs> um and the patient's nearly gonna fall out of bed and I've gone oh yep sorry I was talking to a student and I've just walked away I'm really sorry um but it's reminded me when when you know my my head my head's been somewhere else which happens all the time um other things I do again you know I've already mentioned don't, don't progress too quickly unless you feel like that's the right thing for you um learning from the good and the bad mm -hmm. I think when you're in a bad you know it might not even be a bad rotation it might just be one that you don't quite enjoy as much um or a supervisor that you don't quite get on with as much then yeah kind of learn from the good and the bad mm -hmm. um a lot of who I am today is modelled on people that have inspired me, but also people who have had traits that I have disliked or I've seen go wrong or I've seen people respond to them badly. Yeah. And I've gone, hmm, okay, behaving like that doesn't get you anywhere, so I won't behave like that. Yeah. So, yeah, take, take the good and the bad and, and mould yourself into the, the clinician that you want to be. Definitely. Um, and, and I'd say turn turn frustration into action um you know james you you're three weeks in um i imagine in the coming weeks you'll get quite frustrated that there's an endless list of patients to see um <laughs> you know you 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 will never get through your full caseload on some days you know a patient will be unwell in the morning and then by the afternoon the consultant will say oh can you see this patient because they're ready to go home and you'll go what if you're frustrated by things, turn it into action. So why am I frustrated by it? And what could I maybe do to mm. ease my frustration? Um, and that can be things like systems. It can be teaching that you might need. It might be talking to a consultant and say, oh, actually, like it, it doesn't help me plan my caseload if, if the goalposts move <laughs> mid-afternoon. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just, just finding other ways to, to get what you need out of the job rather than getting frustrated. Mm. It's, it, it keeps you sane as well. It's, it's having that action after after feeling like that. It's, it sort of stops. It, it kind of helps with that frustration, I suppose, doesn't it? it? It then leaves you feeling more, I don't know, more like you've had a benefit to something rather than it's a bit like you know, if there's no point moaning about something unless you're going to do something about it, a sort of sort of action, or even pay a part to that. So yeah, that's great. So. We've, I think we've covered, we've covered all the things and there's been, there's been loads in there and I think it's going to be really helpful, quite specific, but I think we've covered an area that every band five will rotate through. That's almost for certain. And I yeah. think as, as a band five, you're, you're most likely to find yourself um, potentially starting out in, in this area, in medical rehab and, and, and dealing with older people, but particularly we're in a population that is aging so we're going to be seeing yeah. more and more older people and, and treating more and more older people with more and more comorbidities so i think it's been really really useful so before we go on to kind of a few more links and things like that which i really do want to cover um, before we finish so make sure you remind me beth because otherwise i'll disappear and we won't have covered it um i've got the questions that i ask everyone and this has been quite interesting because everyone else i've had on so far has been very much msk based and i think we see an awful okay. lot of MSK literature. There's an awful lot on social media about MSK. And I'm always thinking there is not enough out there and, and being promoted for inpatients and, and say older people and, and medicine side of, of physiotherapy. So this hopefully will be really good. So the first question is about a research paper that it can be old, but remains really important in your clinical practice. Yeah, sure. Um, so the one that, that springs to mind. I should have printed it out really, but I'll give you the link for it. Um, it's a it's a paper by David Oliver, who was um, the Department of Health advisor for older adults, um, and he actually wrote this paper in two thousand and eight. So this paper came out when I was still at university, which I didn't realise at the time. Um, but the the paper is called um, "A Copia and Social Admission Are Not Diagnoses: Older People Deserve Better." is the title um, and it basically talks around how you know a copia is, is sometimes used in hospitals to describe older adults who can't cope at home or something has happened or they've fallen or they're not looking after themselves particularly well mm. and social admission again similar connotations of you know there's nothing actually medically wrong with them they don't need to be in hospital um, and yeah kind of therapists and social workers just need to sort this patient out 
and it basically talks through why that terminology is really damaging to older adults in hospital um, it talks quite heavily about as a medical model why that's very damaging so things like if, if you're on an assessment unit and you've got a, an older adult who's come in with as a social admission or been labelled as a social admission by a doctor that there's evidence to show that the nursing staff will be less inclined to do those patients observations on time which actually in a patient who's probably got multi-morbidities, you know, a high degree of frailty, yes, they may not be looking after themselves very well at home because they've got lots of problems. But if you're not taking observations or a doctor isn't um, particularly in a hurry to get the blood results or, you know, nobody really notices that their oxygen levels have dropped, then actually it can, it can lead to mortality in hospital, um, which means people dying in hospital unnecessarily. Mm. So they, they can be really, really damaging terms. Wow. And that can be the same from a physiotherapy perspective. I, I have seen kind of junior therapists who say, oh, you know, he, he's come in because he's got dementia and he just wanders around, the family can't cope with him anymore. So, you know, he's a social admission, I don't need to see him. Well, well actually, how, how do you know how he functions in his own home? How do you know if we can't, you know, help him to stop being as restless? How do you know he hasn't fallen 10 times in the past year? Mm. How do you know that he doesn't normally use a walking aid? How, you know, and, and without assessing him, you don't know any of these things. Mm. So it can be quite damaging actually to those, that patient group, um, which is why. And other phrase, it, it kind of covers other phrases as well. Things like off legs. I don't know if you've seen mm. that one yet, James. Yeah. yeah. So what, what the hell does off legs mean? It's not a diagnosis, is it? Mm. Yeah. Um, so it, it just it's a really good article at making you think about the you know the ageism that's faced in this country um, i know there's a you know black lives matter and a lot of talk about racism but ageism mm -hmm. is is equally as bad yeah. um and it, it talks about phrases that you can use and that are helpful to a patient um because what often ends up happening you know if i went to a and e and i said i have abdominal pain that's why i've come to a and e they, the doctor has a very specific idea of what my symptoms are. I can tell them very clearly what the problem is and they know, you know, that they need to do an abdominal assessment on me as well as lots of other things. If an older adult presents to A&E who can't communicate very well, possibly has a cognitive impairment like dementia or delirium, they have heart failure, they have, you know, chronic kidney disease, they have COPD, they've had a stroke in the past, how is that person supposed to tell the doctor exactly what is wrong with them? Because they might not know. They often present saying, I don't feel well. And it gets labelled as, you know, generally unwell. Yeah. Or lethargic or short of breath. Or, and it, it basically could be multiple organ systems that, that is the problem. But unless you assess them properly, you will never find that, you know, the multiple diagnoses rather than the one diagnosis, which is what everyone tends to to try and aim for as the gold standard but in older people i don't know if you've seen this james in the plans of some of your patients mm -hmm. the consultant will write a diagnosis on the ward and it will be diagnosis one constipation diagnosis two urinary tract infection diagnosis mm -hmm. three low sodium diagnosis four possible tia we need to get a ct head that they're getting diagnosed with several things on one admission yeah yeah. So it's a really good article that talks you through, um, you know, the, the, the pitfalls of older adults and the terminology that you use with them. Yeah, definitely. That sounds really, that sounds really, and um, I think, is that the Mancunian medic on Twitter? Yeah. Yes. On so, Twitter. Um, yeah. I remember watching David, um, he did a key, I think he was a keynote speaker at um, uh, Physio UK in 2018. I think it was when yeah, I went I there. Um an incredibly engaging speaker and very pas very passionate about older people. Um, and yeah, yeah. He, he writes he writes lots of blogs and things. Um, mm. Follow him on Twitter, and he's you know he's constantly spouting stuff about older adults. So um, yeah. yeah, he's a great person to follow. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's interesting. Uh, I'm aware of time, but I've, I just, it's, it's a fascinating area for me. So um, we see a lot of, of MSK um, talking about that thinking outside of just the physical 
um, issues that a patient might present with and looking at things like their sleep, their social side of things, um, other things that are going on. And, yeah. and I'm just thinking now so many times maybe in, when we're dealing with adults, if, if older adults, if we can't deal with that physical side and we kind of pass it off as a, like you say, a social admission, but there's still loads we can do and loads we can delve into and find out about. And at university, we talk about that and we get taught about yeah. that, but then it doesn't necessarily. Yeah. And it, an example I use in my juniors is if somebody's got dementia on your ward and they're really agitated, mm. we don't mm. immediately think, oh, what are the aggravating and easing factors? Yeah. Yeah. Because actually they, they probably have, you probably can ease their distress with a mm. handful of techniques and speaking to family and, working out what they like and do they like music and all those Mm -hmm. kind of things and and equally there'll be things like that aggravate them like too much noise and people shouting at them and not being familiar with the environment they're in Mm. Um, and lights at night where they can't sleep and being woken up for their obs and yeah you know all of those things we do to people in hospital that are horrible and they are aggravating and easing factors but we just don't label it as that no no no, I think, and, that, and that's a big one as well, that noise, and I mean, it's a whole new conversation, is when you're, when you're dealing with someone, um, an older adult in, in hospital, not being afraid to try and actually get people to be quiet, not other patients, I mean, I'm talking about other staff. Um, yeah. but if you know you've got a patient that, that needs that concentration and doesn't do well with all those other noises, um, yeah, it's working, working with everyone to try and make as quiet the time as you can. But no, it's just interesting about looks of yeah. thinking of that patient a bit more holistically uh, as well. Um, yeah. and another question that's come out of this for me again, I know I'm going to wrap it on a little bit, but it's, <laughs> I think there's something that's, so I'm thinking about what you're saying and about how these, how we can be better therapists with older adults. And then I'm putting my brand new band five hat on and thinking, okay, well, that's great. I, I, I think I can implement some of this. What would your advice be to someone who's thinking, I really want to implement some of this, but what about the time constraints? What about the necessity to do you know to get through those caseloads what would you say to yeah. that what what i would do look at your list of patients in the morning whether you know whether you're qualified or a student um look at the caseload you've been asked to see on that day and just pick one patient and with that one patient give yourself the goal of doing a gold standard assessment problem list treatment plan mm-hmm. onward referral whatever it might be And for that one patient, do your absolute best. And then for the rest of the day, you know, get through the work like, you know, like you intend to do. Over time, what will happen is that that gold standard will start to take less time. Mm -hmm. And you will be able to do the gold standard for not just one patient, but two. Yeah. And as, as time goes on, as your rotation goes on, you will probably find that in a day you can probably do three or four gold standard assessments every day and the rest of the patients who you already know because you already met them a few days ago mm. they will be the quicker ones that keep your pace throughout the day going nicely and and that's the same for you know any rotation really yeah. whether you're on stroke trauma take the time with one patient a day to look at their x-rays to look at their blood results to look at their observations to look at them really comprehensively mm-hmm. and that is where your learning need comes from and you go oh I don't know what that means or I don't know what to do about the fact this patient can't do that I'm going to take this patient to supervision and talk to yeah. my supervisor or my educator about this because I'm, I'm trying my absolute hardest here but I'm drawing a blank yeah and that that's still what I do to this day you know I, each day it varies how many patients I see but there'll be a good couple where I put my absolute you know bring out all the big guns mm-hmm. <laughs> and I will try and do gold standard and I, I sometimes give the example of if this patient was paying you privately to see them yeah what would yeah. you do for them mm. because I bet you bottom dollar it's more than what you've done for them the day before yeah and if that's the answer if you have got more to give them then why aren't you giving yeah. it to them yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, that's great. Okay, fab. There's a there's an outcome to take away. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so moving on to the next question. So, a most the most recent paper you've read that's changed your practice. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I won't be as specific about this, but really, it's all the all the COVID 
um, material that's that's yeah. come out is all the recent stuff that, that I've read, which mm -hmm. um, in all honesty has very little to do with older adults and yet is absolutely applicable to older adults. And the, the common theme with all of the reading around COVID and you know physiotherapy standards, how to treat them, any guidance that's come out, it's all been around key principles of writing problem lists, like doing thorough assessment, <laughs> writing problem lists, yeah. being patient centered mm -hmm. and modifying your treatment appropriately. You know, basically see what's in front of you and treat it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that is the common theme with all of it, you know, regardless of whether they've had a, a brachial plexus injury or, um, you know, really severe breathlessness or real bad anxiety. Uh, or PTSD from being on intensive care. So it they're all principles that are applicable to older adults, but that my my recent reading hasn't been about older adults. It's all been about COVID, which has been lovely at, at the same time because yeah. getting my head around clinical specialisms that I, you know, I'm not an expert in brachial plexus injuries, but the fact I've had the opportunity you know, during this time to refresh my upper limb anatomy, go through mm -hmm. dermatomes and myotomes again, which I don't use every day. Um, you know, go through assessments and outcome measures. It's 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 been great. It's actually served as a really good refresher. Yeah, yeah. And and that translatable skills or transferable skills, sorry, that you, know, you can take yeah. across. Yeah. And I suppose that's a skill as well as, as physios is having that awareness of of when you read something, it may not be applicable really obviously to that one patient but it's thinking yeah. about how might it be or how might it be you know a, a trans transferable to other patients and thinking a bit outside the box really with the stuff you read yeah. okay that's good and then if physiotherapy wasn't an option what career would you have liked to have had now you've already said that you 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 knew about physiotherapy when you were sort of nine years old so that's that's quite early on but um has there only been a, ever been a point where you thought actually yeah i wouldn't mind giving that a go yeah, but they're all hospital related careers. <laughs> they, they, they all would have been, you know, speech and language therapy, you know, radiography, um, medicine potentially. Um, and at, at this point, psychology as well. I'm, I'm really interested in, you know, how our brains work, how we behave, how we learn. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it still probably would all be to do with health and people. Um, outside of that it, it probably would have been teaching which um mm -hmm. you know i end up having i end up doing in in my role in the nhs and in, in with generation ahp as well so yeah. yeah i think any career that i would wish to embark on i i actually have <laughs> exposure to at the moment which is about again about taking those opportunities isn't it and, and it leads you down potentially what you want to do anyway and and i think that's another thing about physiotherapy if, if there's anyone watching this who's thinking about whether to go down the route of of training to be a physiotherapist is one thing I can say is there are endless possibilities of what you can do with a degree in physiotherapy or an apprenticeship in physiotherapy as, as they're coming out as well. Um, yeah. So as, as many people are showing, so that, that's fantastic. I've got a couple of other questions for you that I haven't asked you about. So these are quick fire one. Um, God. <laughs> cats or dogs? Cats. And your favorite thing to do to unwind? See, I'm a, I'm a bit of a freak in that I, I don't often unwind. Um, typical answer will be something like Netflix. Um, but I, I also just like going out for a stroll and listening to an audio book. Um, yeah, I just find someone talking in my ears and just kind of forgetting about the day is, is helpful. We're doing it. L latest audio book? Uh, latest audio book was um, a book called Black Box Thinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's an excellent book i'd recommend anybody to read it it's basically um how how we approach error um both in healthcare and it covers the aviation industry and why there's you know there's very few errors made in, in aviation and yeah. how they manage that and how they learn from their mistakes yeah um it, it actually, the book actually starts off with a really quite upsetting example of a, a really young lady that went in for an elective surgery and um, they they couldn't intubate her. They were having real difficulty intubating her, and time ticked on. You know, clock was ticking. Um, doctors and anaesthetists were still trying to intubate her, 
and it got to the point basically where, where they'd missed the window and her, her sats had dropped so low that she acquired a hypoxic brain injury and, and died and the the narrative of the nurse who was in the theatre with them was that she she noticed that this was happening and she'd got all the tracky stuff out ready okay. because she thought that they would come to the conclusion that they weren't successful and that they didn't need to do a tracheostomy because they didn't have an airway for her but they were so focused on the task in hand that they didn't think wider to actually it's been 15 minutes and we we haven't managed to intubate her yeah um so unfortunately she died but it it goes on to talk about how her, how her husband has been a real advocate for like learning from mistakes and errors yeah. in healthcare and how our attitude and culture really needs to change um and, and that's what i was saying to you earlier people you know staff that work in my trust if if we if we come across a mistake, if a complaint lands on my desk um, and I have to investigate it, of course there's going to be learning needs or things that haven't been done quite you know quite to gold standard. But it's about learning from those mm. and working out how we can embed it to make everybody safe rather than you know penalising anybody because that doesn't that doesn't do anything. Um, no. So it's a it's a really really good book and it's got. It's got application for you personally and professionally. So I, I would really recommend um, really recommend you read or listen. Brilliant. Okay. That's selfish because I'm currently looking for a ne my next audio book. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then finally, recommend us something which can be anything, a book. We can't do that now, maybe. But anyway, an experience, a course, a film, like anything at all. Yeah. Um, I would obviously recommend my, my brother at Clinical Physio. Khalid. Um, yeah, I, th I think my recommendation is is social media, um, whether that be Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, whatever that might be. Mm. I, I just think, I mean, part of the reason I called Generation H HP Generation HP was because I really believe we're entering a new generation of how we are learning. And, and coronavirus has just like set fire to that in terms yeah. of the pace of it. But I very much believe everything is going online. Everything is going to be in bite-sized chunks. Everything is going to be, you know, using the network that we've got in physiotherapy, which James, you've you've already spoken out quite a lot about it, it you know, it being very good that you've got specialists on hand and you've got people that you can tweet and DM and Instagram yeah. and you, you've got people at your fingertips. So whether it's about something very clinically specialised or whether it's about learning in general or you know my supervisor doesn't pay me any attention what should I do um so yeah my, that's my recommendation use the new platforms and the new community that you know people like Khalid and I are, and you James and um you know other physio students we're, we're trying to build this really supportive community um so yeah please please use us that's why we've why we've set these things up Definitely. I, I can't recommend that highly enough. I mean, I know I started using Twitter, I think it was right at the beginning of my first year. And one of the things that struck me right away was the, the amount of want from other physiother qualified physiotherapists and very experienced physiotherapists to help students. I never once um, had anyone even ignore me or say they didn't have time or anything like that there was just an overwhelming desire to support me as a student for any questions I had. Um, and, and, you know, and that, that's, that's everyone uh, up the tree, you know, no, there was no hierarchical barrier to that at all. Um, so, and I would just really second that in terms of using social media, but also reaching out as well, rather you can, you can passively use it and take it all in, but I would I'd engage with it as well because there's some, some, brilliant contacts to be made and some really supportive online friends as well within the network yeah. and i think you know a lot of my content is 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 based on what i see in practice and what you know my opinion is about what we need to be doing better but if, if there's things at, at university that you know either go too quickly or that you did too long ago and then you got a placement and you need a refresher all those kind of things or you want a clinician to teach you rather than a lecturer to teach you then you know, let us know because our, our content is guided by you know what you guys feel like you need so you know speak mm -hmm. out yeah 100 percent. And, and i'm just sort of going on to now sort of the, the links to generation ahp because um it's uh, you've obviously got the the instagram um platform which has got a plethora of of information activities advice 
if you go on to all the stories, I mean, I'd definitely recommend that. Um, you were invaluable for me for when I was looking to, to apply for my job, particularly, and you were incredibly helpful with that. So, I mean, it'd be good to, to tell us a bit about that, but also you've got the website now as well that's been revamped and rebranded. It has, yeah. So, um, so I suppose that I started Generation AHP in September last year. Um, and I, you know, I'd been thinking about it for a long time um, as a concept and, you know, just kept t taking myself down different rabbit holes. And it, it just got to the point where I thought, you know what, just do it and see what the appetite is mm -hmm. and see how much of a response I get. And, and absolutely overwhelmingly, it, you know, shot up to like 5,000 followers in, in not much time at all. And, yeah. um, you know, loads of DMs and, you know, every night there was questions and queries and thank yous and comments and great replies on my stories and um so yeah kind of that those few months became my my proof of concept really that that it's a page that you guys wanted so i've mm. you probably noticed i've been you know a bit quieter on the page it's it's because i'm doing stuff in the background to try and set up you know a more a more reasonable structure for me so to balance my my full-time clinical work and and running generation ahp but getting things like you know the branding right and setting up a website what what i'd really like to do with the website you've, you've if you've been on there you've probably already seen the resource hub and um, that is really that's the tip of the iceberg i i want to build that so that it's like a one-stop shop that you can go and there are links to everything you will need to know for you know i'm starting this placement what what would be useful to read i'm starting this rotation what you know what might i need um you know who's good to follow on twitter you know which podcasts are good which books are good I, I want to put all of that into one place um so that you can go on there no matter which point in your career you're at and you you've got those resources to hand um and you know on top of that um doing you know tutoring if people are interested and you know online webinars and you know all those kind of things um you know they're they're all still to come so yeah lo loads of plans for for future that's brilliant really really exciting and it's um as you say that what what's all what you've already done has been proven to be wanted and very much appreciated so i think it's it's um an exciting start to the next phase of generation hp i think that's brilliant <laughs> So if people want to find Generation HP, I think you've made it very, very easy because I think, am I right in thinking the handles across all social media are, are the same as? They people? are. Yeah. So at Generation HP for uh, Twitter and Instagram. And I am on Facebook, um, just not a lot. Um, and yet the website is just www.generationahp.co.uk. Um, and yeah, it's, it's all very straightforward. And if there's stuff that's not there that you want to be there, just let me know and, um, I'll happily fill the gap. Fantastic. That's brilliant. I think we've covered loads there. And as I seem to have been making a name for myself in terms of timing, that's gone on for quite some time, but there's tons and it's really focused. And I think there's gonna be some great stuff there for, for students and, and new grads and, and just band fives and maybe even band six and sevens and eights. So brilliant. Thank you so, so much for all of your time, Beth. And I'm sure we'll have you on again at another point to talk about something again, more specific and, and helpful. Yeah, I'd love to, I'll happily come back. Brilliant. All right. Thank you very much, Beth. We'll speak to you soon. Thank you, James. Thank you. Cheers.